Do you want to unlock the deepest secrets of arcane magic? Do you want to level entire armies to dust with the wave of your hand? Or perhaps wield spells that let you control the very fabric of time and space? Well, we're going to show you how with our guide to the wizard in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Greetings, apprentices. My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Today we're bringing you the very first in our class guides for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. We're focusing on the wizard today, which is uh, my and Monty's, uh, one of our favorite classes to play. In fact, for both of us, uh, the wizard was one of the very first classes that we delved into for our first long-term campaigns in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Monty, what is a wizard? Well, a wizard is really the classic arcane spellcaster, the magic user, the mage uh, of the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Yeah, and a lot of their a lot of their magic use comes from knowledge, which makes them one of the most intelligent classes as well. In fact, probably the only of the core twelve classes that really makes being an intelligent character their core focus. So let's take a deeper look into the wizard. So Monty. Why would we play a wizard? Well, the wizard is a hugely diverse class, and it's capable of fulfilling a wide range of party roles, from um, damage dealing, to controlling the battlefield, to providing unprecedented levels of magical support. And that's really the core of the class. If arcane magic, if the mysteries of supernatural powers are what really excites you, the wizard is the class that you want to start with. I often think of the wizard as a Swiss army knife in the fact that they have the largest range yeah. of spells and you can really look at that spell list and um, kind of just pick and choose what's going to be appropriate for the job that needs to get done. Yeah, it really offers a lot of flexibility. So if you're someone that likes to think about problems in advance, make a big overall strategy and execute that. The wizard in the way it plays in the game is going to give you a lot of satisfaction with that. Two people playing a wizard in the same party can play completely different characters. Your wizard might be a dedicated genius scholar. They might be an inspired archaeologist, or a canny investigator, or even just a power-crazy mad scientist. There's tons of archetypes that you can explore with the wizard. They're one of the most diverse classes in Dungeons & Dragons. This vast magical power means that all wizards have one thing in common. Knowledge is power. And there's lots of great examples from fiction, books, movies, and video games that you can draw on for ideas to inspire you. Hermione Granger from Harry Potter. Or Harry Dresden from the Dresden Files books. Uh, both of these are very intelligent characters that learned magic from a spell book uh, and use it to solve a huge range of problems. Also, if you're into comic books, Doctor Strange, even though he's known as the Sorcerer Supreme, if you actually look at the way he is represented, he is a wizard because he learned all of his spells yeah. from reading textbooks. Of course, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the ultimate inspiration for the wizard archetypes. Gandalf. Gandalf, Merlin, uh, and of course Turgeon of Mir from the Dying Earth series, who probably have the most influence on what we think of as a wizard. There uh, are also some famous wizards from D&D lore itself. Of course. Elminster, the alter ego of Ed Greenwood, the creator of the Forgotten Realms, and Morden Kaiden, the alter ego of Gary Gygax, the creator of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and other famous wizards like Raceland Magier, um, Illustrial Silverhand, I'm thinking of also World of Warcraft as Jaina Proudmoore, uh, and Yennefer Avengerberg from the Witcher series. All of these are great wizards that you can draw on for amazing ideas. I also think of, just think of like all the philosophers and scientists. Yeah. Like you could have an amazing wizard that's based on like Mary Curie or Albert Einstein and the kind of way that they looked at science uh, could be applied to the way that your wizard thinks about magic. So when we're looking at which stats you want to take as a wizard, what 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 should, what should we be looking at? I think it pretty much goes without saying, but intelligence, intelligence is your most important stat. And really, this is the stat that you are here for as a wizard, because the wizard is one of the few classes in the game that gets a lot out of intelligence. Uh, your intelligence score is going to inform your most important skills and saving throw, but it's also the stat that powers all of your spellcasting. Your spell saving DC, 
your spell attack modifier, even the number of spells you can prepare is based on your intelligence score. So having that high to begin with and keeping that one high using your ability score modifier, uh, a modifier boosts on intelligence is going to be really critical. You want to get that up to 20. Now, as a spellcaster, you're going to be dealing with a lot of concentration spells, which means that the next stat you should probably look at is constitution. Yeah, also you don't have a lot of hit points, so having a good constitution score is going to have uh, going to offset that weakness a little bit, give you the extra hit points to stay in battle when you get that one big hit, which tends to be the thing that takes out a wizard. So dexterity is going to give you a better initiative and armor class. Uh, so that's going to help you out defensively as well, as well as offensively. And then from there, you can really decide what you don't want to focus on. If you kind of want to do the absent-minded professor thing, uh, you might want to dump your wisdom. Although really, I, I've never found very many uses for strength as a wizard, but some yeah. people might. But that tends to be the common dump stat for a wizard. You may or may not care about your charisma score. Um... Wizards have a lot of great mind control spells and spells for social interaction. And so having a charisma score that's positive and proficiency in a couple charisma skills will help you out a little bit in that regard, uh, just to make your magic more potent. But remember, if your wizard is having trouble making friends, they can always cast spells to help them. <laughs> that's very true. Almost any race can conceivably play a wizard, but really you're looking for, if you want to play a strong wizard, the races with an intelligence boost are where you're going to want to start. This is going to be include things like gnomes, which are really the quintessential, like, I think for a lot of people, illusionists and enchanters. They get plus two to their intelligence, so they're a really good pick right off the bat. Uh, also, one that me and Monty both really like is the variant human. And that's because yeah. the variant human gets a feat right off the bat, and there's some great feats, but we'll talk about those in a second. Exactly. The, the variant human is a, is a great choice as yeah, well. Yeah, and you can boost your intelligence and your, um, your constitution. constitution or dexterity, because you get the two plus ones, and you get an extra skill, which is kind of a nice pickup. Yeah. Um, also, high elves? Yeah, they're cool because you get an extra cantrip. You get the dexterity boost, you get perception as an extra skill, you get dark vision, you get a couple extra weapon prof proficiencies. Uh, then there's also tiefling, I think, was another good one. Yeah, tieflings get fire resistance, uh, dark vision, um, an intelligence boost, and a charisma boost. Uh, beyond that, you can really go anywhere with the wizard, um, as long as you really do have that strong intelligence bonus off the top. Weapon and armor proficiencies. <laughs> yeah, wizards get none. Um, so if you're looking for someone to drop into the throes of melee combat, wizards really <laughs> don't have anything to start off with. I one time chose to not cast a spell on a turn and try to use my crossbow, and what was even the point in not casting a spell that turn? I don't know. Also, wizards only have a d6 hit die, which means you are very squishy. You're not going to have a lot of hit points. Uh, and it's pretty easy if you get too close up to the front for someone to land a critical hit on you and you are taking a nap. So yeah, you generally want to play the back lines because your, your weapons and armor uh, don't exist. Yeah. On the other hand, wizards do bring an interesting skill set in terms of their other proficiencies. Um, because they're one of the few classes that focuses on intelligence, it means that they're one of the few classes that has a really high arcana, history, and investigation skill modifier. Yeah, which, which really makes them a unique part to any team, because most teams, I find, uh, most parties uh, have a severe lack of intelligence, uh, which kind of just makes your whole party a bumbling mess of idiots. But <laughs> when you're playing the wizard, you can feel safe knowing that you are the smartest one there and that you secretly know everything that's going on. Yeah, and this carries through into the wizard's saving throws. They're proficient in both wisdom and intelligence saving throws. One of the few classes that actually has this breakdown. Uh, this means that really scary monsters like Mind Flayers uh, and um, Intellect Devourers and scary spells like Feeble Mind, you're actually pretty resistant to these kind of effects. That said, you still probably will want to be really cautious because you have the most to lose. Yeah, a wizard who loses their brain is not a wizard at all anymore. Sadly. So, yeah. Watch out. Watch out. But you are more resilient to these things, so it's great. Uh, so there's a few feats that are very specific to spellcasters. Uh, one that you're going to want pretty early is Warcaster. Yeah, it gives you advantage on your uh, concentration checks. Um, which is like getting a plus five bonus. So it's really important. Uh, the one that you might want in addition to that is resilience for your constitution. This will boost your constitution score 
and give you proficiency in uh, constitution saving throws. Having both these feats, I can tell you from experience, means that you pretty much never fail a uh, concentration saving throw, which is really handy for those critical battles where you need your concentration spell to stay going. There's also a feat, Elemental Adept, which is good for any blaster wizard. Yeah, because it negates uh, the damage resistance, which you're probably going to choose for fire, because fire spells are so good in this edition. In my opinion, I think that you should boost your intelligence to the maximum of 20 before you start taking feats. But this is what makes the variant human so good, because you can sneak in Warcaster or Resilient right off the top and then boost your intelligence, and then in higher levels you get to pick up the extra feats you want. Arcane Traditions are the archetype feature of the wizard class, and most of the Arcane Traditions are based on a school of magic. Uh, everything from Adjuration all the way to Transmutation uh, and more all have an individual school, and so the wizard specializations tend to focus around one school of magic and boosting spells associated with that school of magic. Now wizards also end up with, I think the most, if these are considered subclasses, they, they have the most in the game. Yeah, be, uh, second only to the cleric. Oh, second to the cleric, um, yeah. Because they get eight core specializations, and then between the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide and the uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, they have two more in the published rules, and a few other ones in on on Arthur Canna. So they have a huge range of uh, selections. That said, the Arcane Archetypes, um, we're not going to talk about every single one of them in detail because really they're a small part of your class. It's not one that you need to stress out about too much. Um, I recommend just pick your favorite school of magic and go with it. Yeah, just because I played an evoker did not mean that I could not take spells from other schools of magic. That's not the case here. And that's a really important thing if you played prior editions of D&D, &D, where specialist wizards had to give up schools of magic. In 5th edition, you don't have to do that. For It's really just small boosts to those spells. Like, as an evoker, I could negate my party from being hit. Yeah. by my blasty spells. And you also get a small damage boost, and small eventually you get boost. over channel, which makes the spell deal max damage. Which, which I is super loved. Cool. Yeah. Combine that with fireball, and you have a good day. Uh, I loved playing the diviner, on the other hand, um, because I love information gathering, and as a diviner, you actually get to get a spell slot back every time you cast a divination spell. Uh, this is super cool because divination spells often aren't good in combat at all. They're more suited for information gathering. And it means that you don't have to feel like you're making that trade-off between getting more info and then contributing to the battle. The Diviner had that really cool ability that as a DM I absolutely despised him having yeah. with the dice. Um, Portent. Yes. Uh, and Portent is probably one of the most effective abilities across the, the wizard's spell archetypes. Because Portent allows you to roll a couple d20s in advance, two at first and eventually three, you write down what you got, and then at any time, any roll that anybody makes that you can see, you can say, ah, ah, ah don't even roll the dice, this is what you get. <laughs> yes. um, it's a hugely effective ability because you can basically say, that bad guy that just got hit with my disintegrate spell gets a one on his saving throw. Or you can use it to save yourself uh, by the inverse, but often I used it uh, the other way around to force the, them to fail the first saving throw. Uh, I, I think I, I'd also give honorable mention to the minion Mancy of the Necromancer, uh, because being able to raise up huge numbers of undead, um, get necrotic damage resistance, uh, is really, really cool. If you want to play a Necromancer, though, talk to your DM first, because A, you're, you might be playing an evil character as a result, um, and managing the number of minions that you can have under your command as a necromancer can be a lot of work. So let's talk about some of our favorite spells. We're not going to be able to talk about all of them. But because there's hundreds. <laughs> yeah, but we're going we're gonna to highlight some of my and Monty's yeah. favorite categories of spells and some ideas on uh, yeah. what to look at when you're playing a wizard. I will say right off the bat that if you are having trouble selecting spells, my advice is to just try them. See what you like, see what's working for you. That said, there's a couple broad categories that the spells fall under, and I recommend, as a wizard, you want to have at least one spell of each category prepared or in your spell book. And our first category is blasty spells. Yeah, which, things that blow up the world. And that's my personal favorite, that's why I played an evoker, that's why I love fireball. Um, this yeah. is going to include spells like burning hands, um, shatter, flaming sphere, lightning bolt, fireball, 
um, Ice Storm, Cone of Cold, Chain Lightning. Um, I find that pick like one or two of these yeah. that you have access to. You want you want some way to, you know, when you're in combat to just be like, I'm going to do a mass amount of damage. Battlefield control or crowd control spells. Things like uh, sleep. And sleep, um, wall of force. Wall of force, yeah. Hold person, mm -hmm. um, hypnotic pattern um, would be some of my really big recommendations here. Yeah, these are less damage and more just like you're going to change the way the battlefield's working using these spells. Yeah, you might even bring into effect like cloud kill, con conjuring a, a cloud of poison or wall of fire. It's going to shape where your enemies can move on the battlefield and create a really potent effect. Now, generally, these are always going to require your concentration. So um, you want to choose these ones carefully. Don't load up on too many of these spells. Pick the ones that um, fit the circumstances you're going to be in because you're usually only going to use one of these per fight. Emergency spells is another category. And emergency spells are things like shield or um, invisibility. Or mere image. Counterspell. Of course, counterspell. Uh, these ones are super important because these are the spells you're going to cast when the situation has turned really bad. <laughs> we mentioned earlier that wizards are squishy. Well, the shield spell can really help out with that. Yeah, with a plus five bonus to your AC as a reaction. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we would be remiss not to mention the sheer power of counterspell and also that you need to watch out for it as well. Yeah. Counterspell is a critical tool in the wizard's uh, arsenal. Uh, it allows you to stop a spell before it even happens. Um, and I think that every wizard should bring it. Um, and it's one of those things because it competes with Fireball. So you have to think, like, am I going to use this third level spell slot? Yeah. yeah. So next up, we have a little bit more situational spells and buff spells. These are the type of spells that um, you might not always use them in every situation, but you want to pack one or two of them to help you solve some problems. Um, I think the top of my list for this one um, is Invisibility. Invisibility, which is your get out of jail free card. Almost, not, not all the Well, time, I mean, but... sometimes you can use it in combat with greater invisibility. Yeah. But uh, the ability to use it to infiltrate a situation is amazing. But this is where you'd also have spells like telekinesis. Yeah. Uh, or teleportation circle to transport you around. Plane shift. Um, other spells like dimension door and misty step. The tactical teleportation spells that... These spells, the situations where you want to teleport are not gonna, always going to come up, but they're going to be really, really useful when they happen. Uh, fly would be another one that I would throw in here. Not always sure when you're going to use it, but think about all the different environmental things that you can encounter or bypass with just a single spell. Uh, stone wall or, uh, or pass castle wall, wall. right? Get through the castle walls. So always be on the lookout for spells that you can use in interesting ways um, to really solve problems in a big way. Rituals, which is a, a pretty big category and something we're going to be talking about in depth in a, in a later video. But. Yeah, the really cool thing with Rituals is that Wizards are the only class that doesn't have to prepare the Ritual to cast it. If the Ritual's in your spellbook, you can cast it without using a spell slot, as long as you have your spellbook with you. Yeah, and Rituals are, are mostly going to be, or should always be, out of combat. They are, spells. because they, yeah. they take 10 minutes to cast, yeah, so. but... They can have really critical effects. Simply put, just summoning your familiar is a ritual spell, mm -hmm. right? You can alarm your campsite with alarm or create an impenetrable barrier that lasts eight hours with Leoman's tiny hut. Um, you can also have things like water breathing or a telepathic bond between your entire party members. Um, because wizards are such flexible and powerful ritual spellcasters, it's a really important area to look at. Yeah, so keep that in mind, and it will say that on the spell definition, yeah. it will say that it's a ritual. Yeah. So just keep those in mind. Some spells can be cast as a ritual, but can also be cast... With a normal cast with time. With a normal cast This time. would even include things like detect magic. Yeah. But usually you're going to want to save your spell slots and use it as a ritual. Our last category for spells is information gathering. These are spells like Arcane Eye, Scrying, and Contact Other Plane. Your divination spells, which can help you understand the world around you uh, and really are critical i think for the wizard because when you're using spells like um contact other plane to talk to extra planar sages or scrying to spy on your enemies this is giving you more power as a wizard because the more information you have the better you are able to choose the right spells to prepare 
Yeah, it's something that's really incredible and very unique to the wizard is the yeah. ability to kind of just spy on your enemies, which is something that you don't get to do very often in D&D. &D. Or if you're Monty and you use Arcane Eye, you can just ask me, the DM, hey, can I just fly my eye around the entire dungeon and map yep. it all out? And I couldn't think of a reason why he couldn't do that, so he got the whole layout of the dungeon. So now that we've talked about all the different things that wizards can do, why don't we talk about how to play them? Yeah, there's tons of different role-playing ideas for wizards. We talked about some of the inspirational ideas, of like characters like Hermione Granger and Harry Dresden that you can draw on for ideas. But I think that there's a couple questions that are unique to the wizard that you really want to think about when deciding how to role-play that character. And every wizard is searching for knowledge and, and power and magic. So that's, that's not a good enough... Yeah, I yeah. think that that's the common thread for most wizards want more arcane power. So making a character that's solely motivated by that needs a little bit of an extra dimension. Like, think about Dax, your wizard that you played. My evoker half-elf wizard. Um, he was a half-elf, which made him kind of an outcast in his family. So his whole thing was he wanted to prove himself worthy to his family of being their son by gaining more power and becoming the strongest wizard he could to prove a point. Mm -hmm. So it was it was driven by by his family, his want to fit in, um, which was a little bit more than just he wants more power. It was he wants more power because. Yeah, whereas my uh, wizard, Sebastian Whitemere, was um, outwardly a bit of a fop, uh, but a strategist because he was loyal to his nation and he was working kind of undercover to figure out what all these pirates were actually up to, even though on the front end, he was bluffing and pretending to be a pirate himself, right? And he knew that magic was the only way that he would be able to infiltrate this organization. Um, what a core question to ask yourself when you're making your wizard's backstory is, how did you learn magic? I think that saying that you went to wizard school is super cool, and I don't see it enough. Uh, wizard school is awesome, and uh, having those in your campaign worlds um, really helps explain why magic has spread. But of course, your wizard might have learned it from a dusty old tome that they found in their basement. Yeah, but either way, if wizards exist in your world, that means that textbooks and, and spell books exist in the world, and that lore yeah. and knowledge of wizards exists in the world because they have to learn it by studying it. Yeah. So there has to be a place that they went to study and find these old tomes. Perhaps they're old forgotten tomes, or like Monty said, perhaps there's a school. And putting a wizard school in your world is so cool. Yeah, and you can get tons of inspiration for that from like uh, Wizard of Earthsea or the Harry Potter books. Yeah, you can do uh, a whole campaign about it. Oh, you, you really could. It would yeah. be an awesome campaign too. What does your wizard do with their spell book? How do they protect it? What does it look like? Is your wizard spellbook kind of looked like an artist's sketchbook that's been well-worn and its pages are all frayed at the edges? Or maybe it's something crazy like a metal-bound tome with, with iron plates all over it that you have to engrave lovingly into. Well, so Dax, my evoker, uh, his spellbook, because he was a bit of a mess, he was a bit of a, a, a cluttered person, uh, he really liked blowing things up, and he was he was a little loopy. Um, his spellbook was just, like, bound in rope and looked like it could fall apart at any second, and he wasn't... We're, nobody yeah. was really sure how exactly it stayed together. <laughs> it was like a rough collection of notes that yeah. just kind of tied together, like that professor that's always running late. Right? Yeah, and yeah. what about your diviner? What was... He was super cool because he um, he had a gun. Um, and he had a bandolier of bullets that had the spells written on each bullet, and he loaded the bullets into his magical gun, which was really just a wand, right? We just kind of reflavored it. It was yeah. su super cool. So you can think of really cool ways to, to treat your spellbook. Yeah. The, the final sort of uh, question to leave yourself with uh, as, as your wizard um, really comes back into that, what is motivating them? What do they want to do with their arcane power? right? They might be on a quest for knowledge, but why are they on that quest for knowledge? What are they looking for answers to? Um, and that can really drive your character. Um, I like to give the example of Hermione Granger. Um, she's a brilliant person, um, but she's someone that is motivated by, I want to help my friends and do what's right. And I know that the only way I can do that is because I am smart enough to help them. Like straight up, Hermione does everything in those books. 
Like, she's, Harry she's the gets girl. the credit, but, like, she makes the plan, and she executes it. And um, she knows that without them, like, she loves her friends, so she helps them out, right? Yeah. Yeah, in the best way she knows how. Um, uh, Doctor Strange, who we talked about earlier, yeah, completely selfishly motivated to find a way to cure himself. Although he, he ends up flipping, like, once yeah. he learns the powers and learns how much evil there is in the world because yeah. of these powers... He does flip that, but his, his initial backstory is, I messed up my hands, I hear there's powers out there that can yeah. help me, and he is a very self-centered person, and that's his backstory. You know, another one that's a kind of interesting motivation, I'm, I'm thinking of, like, Mr. Freeze and Rick Sanchez, of, like, maybe you have a relative that died or is dying, and you don't want to go to Divine Magic for that answer, but you th know that, like, maybe your wizard's goal is, I want to research the clone spell so I can clone my dying brother before he passes away. Or I want to find the, um, I want to learn the plane shift spell because my children were stolen from me by a demon and I need to know plane shift so that I can do that. So I love to That's use, great. like... Pick a high-level spell and say your wizard's quest is to learn this high-level spell. I want the wish spell. Yeah, everyone wants the wish spell, but like, but but it's it's reality warping in, I, I in its I definition. Know. But that's a great motivation. If your character's like, I want to learn the wish spell. What would your character wish for? So that's our guide to the wizard class. I hope that this guide helps you uh, wield the ultimate arcane power with uh, aplomb. And yeah, wizards are easily one of my favorite classes to play. Yeah, they are. They seem like really complex on paper, but once you get into it and start learning your spells and how they work and know that you can always change them out, you'll be slinging spells like a pro. If you want to learn about how spellcasting works in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, we do have a video that explains all of that right over here. And if you're a DM looking to figure out how to make a villainous wizard, we've got some suggestions on spells you might consider right over here. Thank you so much for watching the episode. Please subscribe to the channel. And tell us your favorite spells and wizard tips down in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you, see next, you next time, time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.